Okay, so video two of the kinetics chapter is about what these um, exponents really mean, okay? So the x, y, z, or m, n, b, or whatever you want to call those exponents are actually really important in understanding how a chemical reaction happens. That is how we figure out the mechanism of a reaction. And the reason that's important is like if say I am making a medication and I need to make it as quickly as I can, um, it, if I have a reaction, let's just make one up, okay? We're gonna make up a reaction, but um, if I have a rate law that looks like this, oh, there's a K there, whatever it is. Um, if I have something that looks like this, I wanna speed up my reaction. I'm going to be changing the amount of reactant A because say I double A, I get quadruple the speed of the reaction, right? Quadruple the rate, actually. Um, if, I, if I double B, it's probably gonna cost me about the same amount of money, typically. Maybe there's a really big difference, but typically it's around the same. Then what I get if I double B is I only get double the rate. So I'm not getting as big a bang for my buck. And it is super important in industry, whatever industry you're going into, you want to look at these and figure out, okay, so which one should I manipulate in order to make the reaction go faster? Whichever one that is, is what we call the rate limiting step. That's the one that slows it down the most. Um, so that's what, that's what kinetics does for us, okay? So um, when we think about these reaction orders, uh, if it's, so, the, so this logic is what you can apply without really having to do the math, right? So if I double something and um, the reaction rate doubles, okay, it has to be first order because basically the math you're doing there is 2A equals 2 times the rate, right? And so in order for this to be true, X has to be 1, right? To review of algebra. By the way, there is a decent review in the back of your textbook. There's a math review for logarithms and exponents, and that can be really helpful in getting through this chapter um, for some people. So if you double the concentration of a different reactant, so in this case B, and the rate quadruples, so 2B raised to the Y, equals four times the rate now, that's what quadruples means, quad four, then the only way that can be true is if, is if y is two, because two squared, two squared equals four. Um, to get the total overall reaction order, you just add everything up. So in this example here, the, the rate would be whatever constant times A raised to the one times B raised to the two. And if we had real data, we could plug in rate, solve for K and have a complete applicable specific rate law. The overall order gives you a sense for how difficult the reaction is. Zero, first, second order are relatively common. It means you have zero molecules that need to be oriented correctly with enough energy, or you have one, or you have two. An actual tertiary reaction like this is pretty uncommon because it would mean you'd have to have three particles oriented exactly right with just enough energy to react, not too much because they'll bounce off, not too little because they don't have enough energy to break bonds. Um, so you can imagine that's really uncommon. In fact, if you go try to find an example of that on the internet, it is not possible. They're all theoretical, not actual things that happen. Okay, but that's how you would find it. it would be each exponent added together is the overall reaction order. Okay, and that gives us a lot of insight about kind of like how likely is this reaction to happen. Now, when we're talking about K's, and I said basically you just pick one of the reactions you've run, plug the rate in, plug the concentrations in, and put your X, Y, Z, Z exponents in there, and then you just solve for K. Once you know that value, it's another way of determining how fast the reaction is going to occur. So generally, uh, the bigger that K is, the faster the reaction. And K can be 
really, really big. Check it out. So reactions that happen on the scale of like something you can watch um, in a, you know, bench top chemistry experiment are going to have values that are very big, 10 to the nine or even higher than that. Um, so those are relatively fast reactions, especially when you think about like rust forming on a ship or, or geological processes. Those values are going to be like 10 to the negative something. Okay. So the value you calculate for K gives you an indication of how long a reaction is going to take to go. The bigger that it is, the faster the reaction is. So the smaller it is, the slower. All right, now in the real world, and this is what we're gonna do in lab, you are going to use a spreadsheet program to plot your data. And eventually, if you're doing this regularly, like if you are studying um, certain biological processes or you're doing this as a chemical engineer, uh, what you probably will do is program your Excel file once so that you just have to put in all your data and it will generate these graphs for you. And then it's just a matter of visually looking at each one and deciding which one is the most linear. So we're going to go through this process for all three of the most common reaction orders. And it's always with respect to A. So we're just looking at one chemical. And A stands for any generic chemical. When you're doing a real reaction, like in lab, you need to put a real chemical in there. So in lab, it might be I minus or it might be per sulfate, something like that. Okay, so if the reaction is zero order, this is our definition for what a rate is. So it's the change in concentration divided by the change in time and it's negative because it's reactant and we're watching it disappear. If it's zero order, that's defined as whatever the K is times the concentration of the, of the reactant raised to the power zero. And of course, any number raised to a zero is one. So you're basically going K times one. So we can actually just say, for a zero order reaction, the rate is equal to K. When you graph, so examples here include photochemical reactions. That means um, reactions that are stimulated by light. There's lots of these in our everyday life, but um, one common one is hydrogen peroxide decay. That's why it's in a brown, dark brown bottle. Another one, this is not everyday life, I hope it's toxic, uh, but is, is hydrogen and chlorine will form HCl. And you can also put uh, nickel, it's supposed to be lowercase i, nickel on a gold surface, I think. So these are all zero order reactions. What it means is the amount of the reactant has no effect on the rate at all. So I can mess with this all day long, double it, triple it, quadruple it, doesn't matter. The rate is what it is. These are both the easiest to solve and also the most annoying because there's literally very little you can do. You could maybe change the temperature to ma manipulate this reaction, but you can't mess with concentrations to affect it. So a zero order reaction is linear when you plot concentration of the reactant. Go away. I don't know why that keeps popping up all the time. So concentration of the reactant versus time, in this case, seconds. Um, here, what we notice is when we do this, because of the definition for um, change in A over change in time, our slope is actually equal, um, the negative of the slope is equal to K. So you don't have to plug it in to your reaction a thousand times to find out what the K is. You can just get it by taking the slope and making it negative, all right? Here we have, um, a plot of ln of a versus time. This is clearly not linear. It's an exponential de decay. So it does not fit the data for, for these reactions, which means it's not a first order reaction. This is a first order graph. Second order is when you plot one over the concentration versus time. And that too is an exponential increase. So it's not linear. This reaction is not second order. Okay. So it leaves an order. A versus time is zero. LN of A versus time is first order. One over A versus time is second order. You'll see why in a second. I'll There's a logic to this. So first order reactions. Um, the, the first definition of a rate law is called the differential rate law because it's a difference, right? Delta A over Delta T. 
And uh, as it turns out, if it's first order, the rate is equal to your constant K, whatever, this is different for each reaction, but it's within the same reaction, it's gonna be constant. Times the concentration of the reactant raised to the power of one, which we often don't even bother to write. All right, now here's where the calculus comes in. And I am never gonna ask you guys to remember this. You are always provided with these equations, even on your final. Um, not this one. You're supposed to be able to generate that. If I tell you first order, you should be able to get to this. But this one is provided to you, or this one, and they're actually the same thing, okay? You don't need to know how to do the calculus. You just have to understand that because this is a delta, it's a change, I can apply, um, I can integrate. And when you do, you're gonna end up with this equation, which can be a rearranged to, to, to make this equation. And they're both handy to use in different situations. So that's why I give them both to you.